Good morning to everybody. Good morning. It's good to see your smiling faces. And although we have, I don't know, 50 to 75 people gone, something like that, we have a great number here this morning. And I want you to know that it's very encouraging when I look out and see all of you who have made an effort to be here at, at worship today. It is indeed an encouragement when we come together. I want to thank the elders for the chance to be able to speak with you this morning and Danny's absence. I know if, uh, if I know Danny that the people at Bible Camp are having a great time. Danny likes to have fun. But if I know Danny, I know also that the people at Bible Camp are growing spiritually. And that's a good combination. And we wish and pray for their safe return to us this afternoon. I know that's a weird picture up there, isn't it? 2020, it's been a fun year. Some people have called this dealing with the coronavirus uh, unprecedented times. I don't know that that's a, that accurate, but for our lifetimes, perhaps it is. Turbulent times. Indeed, we are living in turbulent times. There are many things going on around us that tend to polarize us and separate us. There is this man who has been giving us advice, all kinds of advice, and uh, I'll leave that there. There's this pair. They're running to, uh, for vice president, president and vice president. I'm not sure which order they're in. But another thing about this picture is that uh, they're wearing masks. Do we wear masks or do we not wear masks? There's this group that has asserted themselves in, in the wake of, in some cases, actual police brutality. Along with this group, there is Antifa. And there has come along a new group called the Proud Boys. There's this character. People love him and people hate him. There are the wildfires going on in California and much of the western states burning down many of the forests that we enjoy. There is a growing sentiment of atheism that is prevalent among our younger generations. And they are becoming more and more militant as time goes along. There is the L... GBT, I think they put a Q and an X and a plus on the end of that because it just keeps growing. And it keeps growing because they are becoming more and more militant that we accept their following their fleshly desires to whatever, whatever end that takes them. There are no limits. And they want special privileges and recognition for that. There are the riots burning down much of our cities and putting our police in danger. And so we have, uh, in some cases, we have taken sides. Black Lives Matter versus Blue Lives Matter. And in a few weeks, we have the election, which is coming up. There's a lot going on right now in the United States of America. And so the question I want us to consider this morning is, what is a Christian supposed to do? What should be our reaction to all of the things that are going on in the world around us? We see many kinds of reactions, some positive and some negative. But I would, would want to remind you of this verse in Proverbs chapter 3. As we consider what we're going to talk about this morning. The verse says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your paths straight. I showed you some pictures a while ago that invoke some strong emotions. I could show a picture perhaps of Donald Trump and some of you would be livid just seeing his picture. And some of you would be in love seeing his picture. 
And so what I want us to do this morning as, as we study, I want us to set aside our own feelings and our own emotions. Do not lean on your own understanding, but trust in the Lord. Instead of following our emotions and our feelings, as we study this morning, let's use our minds and reason what God would want us to do. What's a Christian to do? Let's remember to put first things first. I'm not going to share with you probably anything new this morning. I'm reminded of what Peter said. I, I want to stir you up by way of remembrance. First things first. All of the things that we see going around us tend to distract us from what's really, really important. And we tend to forget where our priorities should be. Several years ago, I remember seeing a, a picture of a car. That car had run right square into the back of a tractor trailer unit, and half of the car was under that makeshift bumper on the back of that trailer. The teenage girl that was driving that car was killed instantly. The reason she was killed is because that she forgot to put first things first. The most important thing she had to do that day in that moment was to be driving her car and be focused on her, on her task at hand. But this horrific accident occurred because she had become distracted and she began texting on her phone as she was driving down the highway at speeds that we drive on the road, 60, 70 miles an hour. And before she knew it, she may never have even seen the truck in time. She woke up in eternity. That horrific accident and that tragedy happened because she became distracted from what was really important in that moment. And that's what's going on, I'm afraid. The devil is having a heyday with coronavirus and the wildfires and the election and these movements and the riots and on and on we could go. And he's distracting us from what's most important in life. And if we allow ourselves to be pulled aside to the circus that's going on, our spiritual life will end up the same way that girl's physical life ended up. We have to keep first things first. And so, <clears throat> what does God want us to be focusing on? Well, <clears throat> Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 says that, If then you have been raised up with Christ, keep on seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. And don't set your minds on the things that are... Uh, set your mind on things above and not on the things above that are on the earth. One of my prayers is that I will be spiritually and eternally focused because I think all of us tend to get pulled aside by the things we have a passion for in this world, in this life. They're not all bad in themselves, but they pull us from where we're supposed to be and where we're supposed to be focused and where we're supposed to be headed. Seek the things above. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and the things we need in life will be added to us. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. And too many of us are seeking first our careers, or seeking first our, our hobbies, seeking first our children, or seeking first our families. When Jesus says you need to be seeking first the kingdom of God. Putting first things first, we also notice that we need to be considering what God has to say on the subject. In Psalm chapter 1, we read about the righteous man, and it says there, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is where? In the law of the Lord. And in his law, what does he do? He meditates day and night. 
Tuesday morning at Devo and Donuts, Danny said part of the meaning of this word meditate is mumble. And he said that what's implied here is that this person had so much of the law of the Lord in them that they mumbled it and repeated it. It was on their mind constantly. And why is that important? Because God's Word is eternal. It doesn't fade away like the flowers and the grass of the field, but it endures forever. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 25. Our focus must be in God's Word. Our focus must be on His kingdom. And our focus must be on the things that are above. Now that should be enough for one point, but it's not. So bear with me. The others won't be quite so long. We in the United States, I'm afraid, have reacted to the coronavirus, COVID-19, because in part, for the most part, in this culture, our physical health is the most important thing we have to guard. And there's a whole industry geared to our physical health and youth. But Jesus says that our soul is the most important thing that we have. For what shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For us to have the proper perspective about the dangers that lie around us, we must remember that it's not our physical body's health that is the most important thing in life. It's our spiritual well-being. And if we are walking in the light as God is in the light, we're good regardless of what happens because we have the right relationship with God. And so we need to remember that our soul is the most important thing we possess. Secondly, we need to remember that, that God is still on His throne. I've got some news for you that might make you mad. It might excite you. I don't know. But Donald Trump can't save the United States. Joe Biden can't save the United States. Donald Trump can't ruin this country, and neither can Joe Biden. Only God Almighty has the power to preserve or destroy the United States of America. It is righteousness that exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. And blessed is the nation, Psalm 33, 12, whose God is the Lord. If this nation will be destroyed, it's because sin has taken us over like it did Israel and Judah in the Old Testament. If this nation is preserved, it will be because we have become a nation that follows God and His principles. And God will use whatever man He needs to use to accomplish His will and His purpose. In Daniel, we are reminded that the Most High, that is God, is the ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows on it whom He wishes and sets over it the lowliest of men. Regardless of who's in the White House, God is still on His throne. Regardless of the status of COVID-19, God still reigns on His throne. Regardless of whether we are under a system of capitalism, as we have been, or we move into a new system of socialism, which many are pushing for, God will remain on His throne because it is the Most High who rules over the realm of mankind. And we also need to remember that not only is our soul the most important thing we possess and that God still reigns on His throne, but Jesus Christ is still the King of His kingdom. He filled the prophecy in, in Psalm 110 and verse 1 in Acts chapter 2 when He was set at the right hand of, of God on high and He will reign there on His King, 
kingly throne until the last enemy is destroyed, until all the enemies are put under His feet. And so that happened in Acts chapter 2. We come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 24 through 26, and we see that Jesus again will reign until He has put all enemies under His feet, or they have become His footstool. Verse 26 says, The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And so we find ourselves in the resurrection chapter. Jesus began reigning at His ascension. There was evidence of it in Acts chapter 2. He will reign until He hands the kingdom over to the Father. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 24. The last enemy that be, will be destroyed is death. In the meantime, in between these, He has made us to be a kingdom. Revelation 1 and verse 6. Colossians chapter 1 says that in verse 13, He has transferred us into the kingdom of His dear Son. And, and one of the problems we have with all the nonsense that's going on around us is that we're focused on the wrong kingdom. If we're in the right relationship with God, we should rest assured that Jesus still reigns over His kingdom of which we are a part and because He is Lord of Lord and King of Kings, He will be victorious in the battle against Satan. Revelation 17 and verse 14. All His enemies will be destroyed and thrown into the lake of fire in Revelation chapter 20, verses 10 and 15, or 11 and 15. And so sometimes in our patriotic zeal, and that it's good to be zealous for our country, to be patriotic. But we are first and foremost citizens of an upward and better kingdom, Philippians 3.20. And our focus should be on the kingdom of Christ, which transcends every nation and kingdom that will ever come. Nations will come and nations will go, including the United States of America when it's time. But the Lord's kingdom will endure till the end of time, and that's the kingdom we need to be praying for and making sure we are a part of. What's a Christian to do? We need to remember to focus on the things that bring us together, that unite us. When we, when we consider what's going on in all the things around us, should it be Trump or Biden? Should it be blue lives or black lives? Socialism or capitalism? Should we wear a mask or should we not wear a mask? Should there be a lockdown or should there not be a lockdown? And what we find out is that all of us have some strong opinions about some of these things. But when we force our opinions on each other, these side issues, we tend to divide ourselves instead of uniting ourselves. We need to focus on the things that bring us together because after all, aren't we all bought by the same blood we remembered this morning at the Lord's Supper? We're brothers and sisters in Christ. He's our elder brother and God's our Father. We're a family. Let's focus on the things that really matter. And so, Paul would encourage us in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 3 to focus on unity, to be but to be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. In 1 Corinthians 1.10, that you all agree that there be no divisions among you. What does God want us to focus on that brings us together? He wants us to focus on being united, first of all. And He wants us to focus, secondly, on loving one another. John 13, verses 34 and 35, Jesus said, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I love you, that you also love one another. And by this men will know that you are my disciples. How? If you have love for one another. And so we need to focus on being united. We need to focus on loving one another. And we need to focus on building one another up. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 
You ever get lost in your notes? You're lucky I got lost. Sermon's over. No, just kidding. I have to keep you just a little bit longer. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 26, Paul says that let all things be done for what? Edification. Do, do any of you remember what an edifice is? An edifice is a building. It's a word we don't use much anymore. And to edify means to build. It means figuratively to promote spiritual growth and things that build up. And Paul says, let all things be done for edification. Instead of tearing one another down and dividing over some of these things, we need to be building one another up. We need to love one another. And we need to be striving for unity. And so then, we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Romans 14 and verse 19. But when we make application to these things and put them into practice in our lives, when people hear you, a member of the Hillcrest Church of Christ, talking about another brother or sister in Christ, are they hearing anger and strife or are they hearing love? And appreciation. When people see our post on Twitter or Facebook or whatever social media platform you use, do they see posts which alienate and divide and shut off the walls of the lines of communication? Or do they see posts that would bring us together and build us up and leave open the lines of communication? even about realms of opinion. So we might have further conversation and maybe even bring some to Christ. And certainly we don't want to, by our social media posts, divide each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. We must be building one another up and not be so up in the air, as one member of our class said this morning, about the things that are on the side that really don't have an eternal difference. They're not that significant a thousand years from now. And so we need to be focused on the things that build us up. We need to be focused on the Lord's business. You remember when, when Jesus was 12 years old and they found him in the temple? He had been lost for three days and his parents kind of got on him. How could you do this to us? And Jesus said, don't you know? I must be about my father's business. He had a sense of what he had come to do, and he was thinking about how that was going to take place, his father's business. We need to be about the father's business as well. Jesus told Zacchaeus in Luke 19 that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That was his business he was thinking about when they found him in the temple. Jesus has also given us a job to seek and to save the lost. He commissioned the apostles to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be condemned. That's our job. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2 and verse 9 that we are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Why? That we might proclaim the excellencies of Him who called us out of darkness and into His marvelous light. Why are we here as a congregation of God's people? Why do we exist as a church? Because we are to be about the Lord's business, saving souls. I want to draw your attention this morning to Acts chapter 2. 4 and 5, if you would open your Bibles there to Acts chapter 4 and 5. And I want us to observe the New Testament church going about the Lord's business. Peter and John had healed the lame man at the temple door in Acts chapter 3. 
And they began to preach and to teach God's Word. For instance, in chapter 3 and verse 19, they were told to repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away. And as they were continuing to speak to the people, chapter 4 and verse 1, the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them and arrested them that evening, verse 3, and put them in jail till the next day. And then they were called in before the ruling authorities and asked them, by what name or by what authority are you doing these things? Verse 8 or verse 7. And Peter answered, finally in verse 10, by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name this man stands here before you in good health. And he proceeded to proclaim to them the Word of God. And they threatened them, and they let them go. And they went back to the church. And I want to draw your attention to the prayer that is said, starting in verse 24. But we'll hone in on verse 29 for time's sake. And this was their prayer under these circumstances. And now, Lord, take note of their threats, and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence. They didn't pray for the government to be overthrown, a government that would come in favor of Christianity. They didn't pray to be wise in how they organized their protest group. They didn't pray for a lot of things that we would want to pray for today. But their focus, even in tumultuous times and under governments which hated Christianity, they prayed that they might speak the Word of God with boldness or confidence. And so they continued to speak the Word of God. And more believers in the Lord came to be about uh, 5,000 eventually. But as we go down to uh, verse 17 of chapter 5, Again, there, there arose a problem, and the high priest and all his associates, the sect of the Sadducees, they were filled with jealousy, and they laid hands on them. They were arrested again. And they brought them before the Sanhedrin council, verse 27. And guess what? They heard a sermon again by Peter and John. And they decided ultimately, during the course of this interrogation, it was decided by Peter and John, verse 29, that we, we, you can say what you want to, but we got to keep obeying God and rather than men. You do what you need to do, and we'll do what we need to do. In other words, they ended up flogging them, chapter 5 and verse 41, and they went out from their presence, that was verse 40 rather, and so they went out from their presence rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for His name. They had been arrested at least two times. They had been flogged. They had been threatened. They had been warned. So what did they do? Verse 42 says, And every day in the temple and from house to house they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. My question for us this morning is, are, are we going about the Lord's business or are we worried about this other business that's going on all around us? Brothers and sisters, we need to be about the Lord's business, and we need to be focused on saving souls the way the first century church was focused on saving souls. That is a proper response to all the things going on around us. Finally, what's a Christian to do my friends, in these unsettling times, don't we need to get on our knees and, and pray to our Creator? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we read there that we are to, in verse 16, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. Why? For this is the will of God. For you in Christ Jesus. We need to be a people of prayer. And we need to be praying about pertinent things that we have discussed this morning. But I want to draw your attention, if you will turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 
especially during these times, I think this verse has application to us today. We'll read the first three verses. First of all then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority. Why? So that we may lead a quiet or tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Brethren, we need to be praying for our leaders, for our president, for our vice president, for the Senate as they vote in a new Supreme Court justice. We need to be praying for our Supreme Court. We need to be praying for Governor Parsons. We need to be praying for our local government. And we need to be praying for the election that is coming up the first Tuesday in November. Brethren, if we're not going to God for these things, is God going to help us? We need to get on our knees and pray that things will go well for this country, that the decisions will be made by our governing authorities that will allow us to serve God in peace. We need to be a people of pray, of prayer. I, I don't know about, about you all, but some of these things, well, they tend to bother me. All those pictures I showed are pictures I picked out because those are the ones that those are the ones that cause emotions to stir. Those are the things that bother me. Those are the things that are going on in our world. And I would like to get some closure on those things. We need to be a people of prayer because in prayer there is closure. There are blessings that come our way when we pray. And so we are reminded in Philippians 4 verses 6 and 7 that we are not to be anxious for anything. But we, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, are to make our requests known to God. Be anxious for nothing. So what do we do about that? We give it to God. And then what does God do about that? He gives us a peace that passes all comprehension or understanding. Are we caught up in these things too much? Or perhaps we haven't given it to God. And so God hadn't given us the peace that we need to deal with what's going on around us. God help us to react to our culture the way He would want us to react. What about you this morning? What's your response to all these things? Are you caught up in too much in the things going on around us? Has it affected your spiritual life? If so, you can come back to God through repentance and prayer and confession of wrongdoing. If your sin has been of a public nature, that confession can be made this very morning. If you've never become a part of the kingdom of God, the church of God, which transcends all kingdoms and will be delivered up to the Father at the end of time to enjoy eternity with God, you can become a part of His kingdom by believing in God and the Son that He sent to die for your sins, repenting of your sins, confessing His name, and being baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. That way, according to John 3 and verse 5, you become a part of that kingdom. This morning, if we can help you in a spiritual way, won't you come as we stand and sing?